Psalm 127. Thank you for the song. Amen. Uh, that is our responsibility to continue to press on. And certainly we believe that the, uh, the Lord wants us to do exactly that. He doesn't want us to be uh, giving up, quitting. Uh, there should never be quit in a Christian. Amen. Uh, because at the end of the day, we win. At the end of the, the time that we're here, we win. Amen. It'll be time to quit when we take our last breath. Amen. Uh, our body will, will certainly, our physical body, if we're still alive uh, and the rapture should not occur, we'll be, you know, we will die physically, but certainly when the rapture happens, we'll, uh, we may not have to die. Amen. But until then, don't worry about quitting. We still have work to do. Amen. When I was a young, uh, young boy, my family was into hunting. Uh, we were a, uh, a annual deer camp family. As a matter of fact, deer camp was an annual event for our family when I was growing up as a boy. And I was excited always to hear about the stories of camp. And I couldn't wait for the day would come when I would be able to go and actually start hunting. You know, you only had to get to a certain age, of course, back then. And then Dad would allow us to go to camp as boys to hunt. And I can remember those stories. It was an exciting time for a young boy. Our family camp was well up in the woods in the Waterbury State Forest up there, down near uh, Montpelier in that area. And certainly uh, it was a place that uh, uh, was a young boy's dream to be able to go there and hunt. And I remember Dad and my older brother and some of the other men of the area that were hunting would always tell these stories about the places all over the mountainside. You know, it might be the big big oak tree on the Oak Ridge that they would, they would use as a landmark and they'd tell stories about seeing deer there and then you'd see deer in what was called the basin back then. That was a place where the mountains kind of came down. It was like a big valley and they called it the basin. I remember all those stories and couldn't wait for the day that I would be able to walk those same paths and be able to hunt and do those same things. Uh, and certain, uh, certainly it was exciting for me when I was young and my other brothers as well. And they would tell those stories and make reference to certain places in the mountains. And most hunters knew exactly that were there in that area. They knew exactly where all these places were. They were well-trodden paths back in that day. Those places that, that if you were hunting in that area, at some point you would go through these same places and you were very familiar with them. And that, that was a big thing years ago. You know, as pastor of the church, it's my desire to see our young people uh, stay on the well-trodden path as well. Uh, that is my desire, not only for our children of a church, but also for the young families in our church, and also for the folks that have been here for a while, to stay on the well-trodden path. I believe uh, it's my desire, certainly it is my desire, to see those families and all of our folks in the church be successful uh, in their Christian life. And I told you last Sunday, with the good Lord's leading, I want to preach a few weeks on the home and on family. You know, last week we looked at Hezekiah's dealings, uh, with Isaiah and Isaiah's dealings with Hezekiah. And certainly he was considered a godly king. I told you last week uh, that he was a man that walked after uh, the Lord and did some things that were good. But he was not uh, without his own mistakes and he had his own trials. And we saw some of those last week. And the most important thing we talked about last week is that Hezekiah basically forgot uh, or intentionally left out God from his treasures. Remember we told you last week that he brought the the heathen king in and, and showed him all the treasures, uh, but he never mentioned the fact that the Lord had saved his life and added 15 years and never seemed to really bring that out uh, to those folks. And certainly uh, Hezekiah brought to life the precept that's found in Matthew 6.21 where the Bible says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. For us to be successful in our Christian homes, God must, must reign and be our most valuable treasure. Uh, it can't be any other way. And we need to make this known to all who visit our house. Uh, to every visitor that comes through the door of our home, we should make this truth known that God is number one in, in our life. And everyone that we know needs to be understanding that our treasure rests first and foremost uh, with God and where God fits. Uh, and I'm not talking about doing it disrespectfully. I'm not saying that you bring somebody into your home and browbeat them and you know, make them feel small if they don't understand these things. I'm just simply saying that it ought to be true that when a visitor comes to your home, there should be no doubt that God is number one uh, for you and your family. 
Let us begin this morning with a few thoughts. We're going to go to Psalm 127 in just a minute, but I'm not going to throw a bunch of uh, statistics at you this morning. You know them anyway. But consider the following with me for just a minute. It was, if, if this was a business, if church was a business, and our longevity depended on producing a pure and recognizable product at the end, we would have to admit we would no longer be in business. Because let's just tell you this this morning, that as far as kids growing up in the church and going on and, and, and being the future of the church, we're losing the battle. More kids are leaving the church than are staying in the church. And I believe there's a reason for that. Look at Psalm 127 this morning, if you would. The Bible says in verse number 1, Except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so is he... Uh, for so uh, he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children, now listen, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. And as arrows are in the hand of, his mighty, of a mighty man, so are children of the youth, of thy youth. Uh, happy is the man that hath uh, his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies uh, in the gate. Father, we do ask you this morning to add your blessing to your word. Father, we ask you this morning to just help us to see some truths this morning that will be a help this morning to us all. And Father, we'll be careful to thank you for the things that you'll do. In Jesus' name that we pray, amen. If you're sitting here this morning and you have already raised your children, uh, don't think for one second that this message does not apply to you because it does. If you've already raised your children and uh, you were successful in doing so, hey, you still have a lot to give to young families that might come to you for advice, so this applies uh, to you as well. But, you know, uh, unless you have your head in the sand, you know that the success rate of Christian kids carrying the torch forward is not good. The question that we must ask, though, this morning is why are so many uh, Christian homes not raising godly kids? Why are so many Christian homes not raising godly kids? Have we long-time Christians changed our habits with respect to our worship? With respect to our responsibility to raise the next generation of church members? Uh, let me also ask you this. It's not my intention to beat anybody up this morning. Uh, so if you're feeling that way already, it's not, not my intention. I simply want to challenge your thinking on the subject of raising kids God's way. Uh, let me also add, it's never been God's intention uh, for the church to take the lead role in raising godly kids. It's never been the church's responsibility to raise your kids. It's your responsibility to raise your kids. And God has given that to each one of us that have children. It's our responsibility first and foremost, not the church. The church should be there to come alongside and certainly be a help in that. But it's your responsibility. The church will not stand before God as far as, uh, as an organization and give an account for not raising your kids godly. You will. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1 and Colossians 3.20 gives us a prescribed path on building godly kids. It says this, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then Colossians says, Children, obey your parents in all things. For this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Godly kids are the most important fruit that can come out of a godly home. So we should be very concerned about the stewardship of God's heritage. Children are the future of this church. Young families training their children's, children right are critical uh, to the health of this local church. And from my own observation over the last 17 years of ministry, I've been involved in and seen many youth ministry activities. Uh, for many years, my wife and I took the teenagers to camp. We took them to a godly camp that preached the Word of God. Uh, we taught 5th and 6th graders for years in Sunday school. Uh, we participated in organizing week-long youth activities in the summer. And after all of this, I've come to the following conclusion as to why more Christian kids 
do not stay by the stuff. They have been taught by their pastor and their church and their, par- and their parents. Uh, I've seen recently kids that were taught uh, uh, very fundamentally over the years. Some of those kids we took to camp with us, and I've began to watch over uh, the last several uh, years here how they have just slipped and slipped and slipped and slipped away. Yet today their life has nothing even close or nothing that would even resemble a Christian life, seemingly. It's unrecognizable uh, to the biblical principles that I know that they were taught. I taught some of them. Both use ministry today, I believe, both use ministry today is fundamentally flawed at its core. Not because of the youth workers, although they are partly responsible, but more because the parents do not truly believe God will keep his promises and keep his word. God did not judge the Israelites in the wilderness because they built a golden calf. He judged them because they did not believe him at his word. Because of a simple and pure unbelief, because Moses was testifying the word of God, the Israelites chose not to believe God at his word. Based on my ministry experience and interaction with Christian families, most Christian parents have weak biblical guidelines for training their kids. I'm not saying that because I want to beat you down. I'm just simply saying that that is the fact, as I've observed over the years. Kids are given far too much freedom in making their own choices. Friends, entertainment, media, and so on. Way too much freedom. Parents rely more on how they were raised, what the latest pop culture dictates, and sadly are often more concerned about fitting in with other parents doing the same thing than raising godly kids. God's idea for His children, I said His children, remember those children that you have uh, sitting with you today are not yours. They're God's. And God has asked you to be a steward of them and to train them and do for them uh, what He's given you the responsibility to do. Parents are to train them on purpose. To be righteous on purpose. Not simply to stay out of trouble. You hear Christian parents say that all the time, well, I just hope and I just pray that I can raise my kids and they'll stay out of trouble. That is the same philosophy that the world uses. Just stay out of trouble. Can I tell you there's more to training God's kids than that? Training them to stay out of trouble is a worldly philosophy and has no basis in a Christian home. Parents ought to choose their child's friends. Even my father, unsaved, knew that when I was growing up. My father had no biblical training, but when I was growing up, he told me, plain, plain, pure and simple, you're not hanging around with that boy because he's going to get you into trouble. You're not going to run with those boys over there and do those kinds of things because you'll end up in trouble. My father knew that. And he didn't know an ounce of Bible when I was growing up. But yet, Christian parents allow their kids to go unaccompanied. They allow them to take off to the mall at 12 and 13 years old and be gone for the rest of the afternoon with no supervision. I'll tell you this this morning, if that's the way that you expect your kids are going to grow up into the Lord, you have another thing coming. Parents ought to choose their child's friends. Train them not to be Uh, uh, not only to be righteous, but also to be a servant leader. You know, teach them a proper respect of authority. Those things are lost in society today. We're not seeing uh, even that in Christian kids. And if you don't believe me, go to a youth camp sometime and hang out with some kids for a while. Proverbs chapter 22, if you turn over there with me. Proverbs chapter 22. We saw in Psalm 127 that children are a heritage of the Lord. Proverbs 22 tells us some more things about children. Proverbs chapter 22. Look, if you will, at verse number 6. The Bible says, Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. This verse has been 
the topic of discussion uh, for many years. Uh, many a well-meaning preacher has said that this verse does uh, said that this verse does not mean if we teach our kids right, they will stick by the stuff. Uh, this verse is, is not saying that as Christian parents, we need to do the best we can and hope for the best. No, this verse is a promise from God that if we teach our kids right, they will stay by the stuff when they get old. Uh, many a well-meaning preacher has misinterpreted this verse on a number of occasions. Uh, they say our job is to simply give them the information that they need and what they do with it is their business. You know, we can't make the decisions for them, you know, all their life. Well, I hope no one here believes that way. Because if you do, you're wrong, biblically speaking. In Psalm 127, we read through verses 1 through 5. It's a great chapter for families to read regularly as a reminder of what God says about the home. But let me call your attention uh, back to this uh, verse here in Psalm 22. Well, first, let's hold on a second. Let's go back. I want to, one more thing over in Psalm 127. You don't need to turn back there. We're coming back to Proverbs in just a second. But let me flip back uh, just to pick up a couple of things that I want to make sure that you, you get from Psalm 127. Uh, in verse number uh, 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 3 and 4, look there. Or you don't have to look, but I'll read it to you. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit uh, of the womb uh, is his reward. As arrows are in the hands of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. You know, back in that day, uh, in the Bible days, uh, arrows, bows and arrows, were probably the weapon of choice for most, uh, most military people, most uh, soldiers, etc. Swords and, and, and bow and arrows. You know, let me ask you this question. When an archer that was accomplished at his trade put his arrow in his bow and he drew back and he let that arrow go, do you think for one second that he expected that his arrow was not going to hit the target? I think he expected that it would. I believe that that archer, when he took the arrow from his quiver and he pulled it and he put it in his bow and pulled back, he expected, he well expected that his arrow was going to hit the mark that it was intended to. You notice here in, in that verse that children are likened unto arrows. And as parents, we have a responsibility to uh, send our children forward expecting them to hit the mark. Does that happen by accident? No. It happens because we parents take a responsibility and we, ins we understand that training up a child in the way he should go means that we're going to have to discipline ourselves first and foremost. That archer could never hit his target if he didn't practice. If he didn't spend time uh, honing his ability to, to fire that arrow down range and expecting it to hit the target, he could not do that without uh, putting a lot of work into it. Raising godly kids is the same thing. We have to put work, we have to be uh, diligent about what we're doing. Just like the arrows in the hands of a mighty man. Now everyone knows that that man has that arrow in his hand for just a short period. When he pulls it from the quiver, puts it on the bow, pulls it back and fires, that arrow is with him for only a short time. And the same is true for our kids. If we have a child early in life and he grows up and by the time he reaches 18, 19 years old, he's probably well on his way to being on his own. We have children for a very short time. But God still expects us to send them forward fully expecting that they will hit their mark. And I believe the Bible teaches us that we can know confidently that God's Word means exactly what it says here in this verse, Proverbs 22, verse 6. God is speaking to, chair, to parents here, I believe, with children. But like I said earlier, it doesn't mean that if you're here and your children are grown, this is no value to you. It is because oftentimes older adults, and especially older Christians, can be a great blessing to young families, and we should be. If you're here this morning and your kids have been raised and they're gone and you're still a, a, a mature uh, Christian in your faith, you ought to be reaching out to young families and trying to help them and to try to disciple them and guide them and some of those things. But what is God saying here? Basically, He's saying this. It's, it, it is possible, Proverbs 22, verse 6, it is possible to raise godly kids. 
contrary to what the world will tell you. Contrary to what some churches will even teach. It is possible. God's Word, Proverbs 22, verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So therefore, it is fair for us to say, if the children God has entrusted to us turn out wrong, as parents, we must assume responsibility. You say, well, wait a minute, preacher. Hold on now. These kids have a free will and they can choose to do what we say or not do what we say. And I know all that. Can I tell you? God knows that too. But He still makes the promise. So does that mean that God's Word is of none effect here? That we don't have a responsibility if our kids do not stay on the path? In the verse here, in Proverbs 22, verse 6, the Bible says there, uh, uh, train up a child in the way. That way there is the well-trodden path. The well-trodden path. It continues on and it basically implies that for each child a dedicated, structured training period is essential in their early life if we expect to have them on the well-trodden path for the rest of their life. Uh, Staying on the well-trodden path means that they will stay on the path when they're young, When they're growing up in your home, when they get to be teenagers, they'll stay on the path. When they get to be young adults, they'll stay on the path. When they get to be older adults, they'll still stay on the path. That's a promise from God if we do what we're supposed to do. This is the path parents want their children to take as long as they're alive. The verse does not teach that it's okay for children to leave the path for a while and then return later in life. How many times have you heard Christian parents say, well, you know, little Johnny, boy, he got off the trail early on in his life when we were training him up as a Christian. He got off the trail. But I'm just thankful now he's come back and he's doing what he's supposed to be doing. Hey, I'm glad for that too, but that's not the way God intended this verse to be. The Bible says that they'll stay on the path. That they'll not depart from it. That's what it says, verse 22, or chapter 22, verse 6. He will not depart from it. When that archer in our earlier example sends his arrow on its way, he never intends for the arrow to take a detour. He never intends for that arrow to be headed through the woods towards its target and then make a right turn behind the oak tree and come around by the maple and come around by the hedgerow and bounce off the rock and finally hit the target. No, he he intended for that arrow to go down range and hit its target without making any detours. And as Christian parents, we should expect the same thing if we're teaching our kids right. Let me give you a few simple truths regarding Proverbs 22, verse 6. Number one, suppose I came to you and said that this verse means exactly what it says. And then I said, train your child right and he will be headed somewhere. How would that make you feel? I said, you know, you just take Proverbs 22 and you do the right things by your child, and and yeah, it's true, he's going to head somewhere. Would that give you a sense of confidence about God's Word? I don't think so. Basically, if that was what I was meaning, if that was what I was teaching and preaching with regard to this verse like some people have, I would basically say that the verse really has no value. If this verse does not mean what it says, it has no value. Because then it's left up to our own interpretation about how we raise our kids and how they end up. But God says, no, they, if you do it right, train up a child in the way he should go, he will stay on the trodden path. Now does that mean, let me just clear this up, because I know people say, well, you know, preacher, he's got a will of his own, he can do whatever he wants to do, and if he wants to do this, he can do that. And then, No, but here it is. It doesn't mean that your child's going to be perfect. It doesn't mean that he's going to do everything he's supposed to do as a Christian, neither are we, neither do we. Parents are not perfect. Parents make mistakes. Parents do things that they wish they hadn't done. And so will your child. But at the end of the day, he'll still be on the path. You see the difference? 
How many times do you see kids grow up in church, go to Christian school, uh, be uh, involved in all the youth ministries that the church can deal out? And then when they get to be an adult, they say, eh, you know, church, eh, that's just not for me. I lived it all these years, and nah, it's just not for me. And they leave the path. I'll tell you this morning, that is not God's intention. If we're training up our child right, he, she will stay on the path. Number two, it does not say that if the children have gone away from their intended path, that they will always come back. And I've heard parents tell me before, well, you know, Proverbs 22, 6 says that, uh, you know, if I train up my child right, uh, and even if he leaves the path, eventually he's going to come back. That's not what that verse says. Not even close. If your child leaves the church when they get to be an adult, there's a pretty good chance, I would say better than 50%, that they're not coming back. As Christians, we should, uh, we, we, we probably uh, know people Uh, who can repent and return to the Bible truths, and that's certainly a good thing, and we hope that's true of all children who leave the path, but it's not a guarantee. I hope you're not depending on that. If children have been trained to be on the trodden path, they can return if they lose their way, and we know that that is true, but that's not the way God intends it. No, He intends for them to stay on the path. The more prevalent truth in in this really is if they are on the trodden path, they will not depart from it when they're old. So I believe a lot of times, especially in modern day Christianity, kids are never even on the path to start with. Why is that? Because parents are not on the path. They make church a hit and miss occasion. Uh, They come when they feel like it, don't come when they don't feel like it. Uh, they, they make uh, the, the things of God a low priority in their life. How in the world can we expect that kids are going to stay on the trodden path when that says the way we as adults approach it? Some companion passages here. Proverbs 22.6 is, is a good one. It's certainly it's a promise, uh, uh, but uh, there's more to it. Proverbs 19.18 says, Chasten thy son while there is hope. And let not thy soul uh, uh, spare for his crying. We have many Christian parents today who do not even believe in spanking their children. And I know why it is. Not because they don't necessarily believe the Bible says it. It's because they're afraid. They're afraid of society. See, they're afraid they've been told, well, don't get caught spanking your kids because the state will come in and snatch them away. And I understand that. But that still doesn't remove our responsibility to raise them biblically. We've got to trust God. If we're doing what we're supposed to be doing as godly parents and we're raising kids the best way that we know how and we're using godly wisdom and godly leadership, the state's not coming in to take your kids. He said, well, what about little Johnny going to school and telling his parents, or telling the teacher, hey, my mom spanked me last night, and I was, it was hurt really bad, too. Preacher's going to meddle here. They shouldn't be there to start with. Public school is no place for Christian kids. God has given the responsibility to parents to train their children. And that means also reading, writing, and all those other things. You send them off to this public school system and you better, be belie- better believe at some point there's going to be a controversy between you and your kids and raising them godly. Proverbs 19 and verse 20 says, Hear counsel and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in the latter end. Proverbs 21.11 When the scorner is punished... The simple is made wise. And when the wise is instructed, he receiveth knowledge. Hebrews 12, verse 11. Now no chastening for the present seem to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. 
unto them which are exercised thereby. I understand that if this isn't the situation in your home now and you're feeling kind of trapped by it, I understand that and I'm not, I'm not browbeating you at all. I'm just simply telling you what the Word of God says. There's a verse in, in Job that talks about that God is the best teacher. God is the best teacher. And as Christians, we have the Holy Spirit of God living within us. We have no greater teacher than the Holy Spirit in conjunction with the Word of God. So no, so don't ever sell yourself short and say, well, you know, I, I sure would love to have my kids at home and I'd love to be training them and schooling them and have mom be homeschooling them and all this. Now, I'd love to have that, but we just don't have the ability. That's a lie of the devil. Because God, if you're, a child of, if you're a child of God and you're a Christian parent and you have the Holy Spirit living in you, the Bible says in Job that God is the best teacher that you can have. So you don't have to worry that you don't have the ability. You have the ability. The ability that God has given you uh, to be a parent. He's also given you the, the, the ability to teach your, teach your children the things that they need to know to grow up and to be successful in their Christian life. Fourthly, if a child is dedicated to a certain trodden path and his parents are dedicated to his training, let us ask and answer three questions. Number one, where is the child right now in relation to the trodden path? Ask yourself this morning, where are my children in relationship to the trodden path? If your answer is they're not where they uh, they're not where he uh, they will be someday, but but right now they're they're sort of working closer towards it, and maybe in two or three uh, years or so they might be on the trodden path. You've got work to do. Then you might ask yourself the question: Where was my child? Look at them, evaluate them, say, Where was my child? Is he in the same place that he was four years ago? You've got work to do. Where is my child going to be? Number three. If he is where he should be right now, then the chances are good he will be in the right place a year from now. Because as you evaluate your child's uh, training uh, from the time that they were able to stand up on their own two feet and begin to talk and have a conversation and all those things and you were being able to reason with them, if they're in the same place that they were, spiritually speaking, uh, or in discipline and obedience speaking, that they were when they were five and six years old, then you've got a problem if they're 12 years old. Can I tell you that's one of the biggest things that I see today? We were out there last week, and we were somewhere, I don't remember where we were exactly, but we were sitting, I think it was in a restaurant, we were sitting there, and a, and a mom came in with two young kids, and she led them over to the table near where we were sitting. And the little one was probably uh, barely able to walk because she was kind of tottering around there, you know, almost ready to fall at any second. So she was really a young child. And the mother bends down to her, and she says, Do you want to sit in the high chair, or do you want to sit in the booth? Or do you want to sit in the chair? And of course, the child like, nah, 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 nah. do you want to sit in the high chair or do you want to sit in the booth? I felt like I said, can I help with this? <laughs> you don't reason with a one and a half year old. You teach, you train, you discipline, you tell what a one and a half year old does. If you're 11 or 12 year old is not where they should be. Maybe you should have done more work when they were 5 and 6. But there's still hope. I believe God's word is true. I believe God's word will work. And if we are at a place in our life with our kids that we're not where we're supposed to be, we can still recover. God's mercy and God's grace is rich to us if we're faithful to Him. Let me give you some observations and we'll be done. Some observations that I've learned from life and more importantly from the study of God's Word. Training up. Training up is important. 
Training must then must uh, training uh, to, must be important to us. If we're going to train up our kids, the training has to be critically important to us. It will not happen by accident. You know, we hear people say all the time, I got in an accident with my car. You know, there's no such things as accidents with cars. What you have is collisions. You collide with something that you're not supposed to collide with. Accidents would be if you're driving down the, str- down, down the road and all of a sudden a tree hits you. That would be an accident. And the same thing is true with our kids. If you want them to turn out right and if you want them to stay on the path, you have to train them on purpose. And by the way, train up. And that means that you expect more from them next week than you do the week before, and the next year than the week before, and so on and so on. We have to continue to expect them uh, to, to perform to the training. Number two, discipline does work. Do not buy into the world's lies about discipline. There's never a time out in the Bible. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 22, you're there now. Look down, if you will, at verse number 15. The Bible says, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Did you see that? Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but put him in the timeout chair and everything will be okay. It's not what it says. Discipline works. Don't buy the world's philosophy of discipline. Because the world's philosophy of discipline is why we have such a crazy world. Why we have so many people that are disrespectful. Why we have so many people that won't uh, sit down and be quiet when they're being talked to. Why we have so much political upheaval in the world. You know, Washington is the reason why we have the problems we have. When you have a a house full of politicians acting like three-year-olds, what do you expect? I know you are. What am I? I mean, really? God's grace is sufficient for us. He would not lie to parents about his advice to raising them. God's word is true. Discipline works. Number three, personal responsibility is key. As a parent, I am responsible for training my children. And children, you are responsible for learning what is taught. Too many times we want to pass the responsibility for our failures on to someone else. And can I tell you, it won't work with God at any time. Our personal responsibility is key to this process. And if we want to raise godly kids and we want to have them stay on the trodden path, we better take responsibility. Because they won't turn out the way that they're supposed to if we do not. Number four, yes, there are pitfalls. Just remember, love, commitment, and consistency our key. You know, there's a verse in the Bible that talks about parents provoke not your children to wrath. You know what that verse is really saying? we got to be consistent. What's wrong today should be wrong tomorrow. What's good today should be good tomorrow. And what's good this year should be good next year. What's good uh, wrong uh, this year should be wrong next year. Consistency. If there's one thing that drives a child crazy is a lack of consistency in their training. Well, geez, Dad, you you didn't say anything about that yesterday. Why are you making such a fuss of it today? Well, because I just heard the preacher preach about it. No, it should be the same today. It should be the same tomorrow and the same next year. Kids are going to make mistakes. Children will make mistakes. Parents will make mistakes. Preachers make mistakes. None of us are God. 
But God expects us to do the right thing nonetheless. Lastly, number five, training does bring righteousness. Physical correction and instruction in righteousness results in a spiritual person and spiritual benefits. I believe in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. God clearly promises us as parents that if I train them up on the trodden path, things will turn out right. They'll stay on the path when they get old. If you're here this morning and you have a child that you trained up or that you thought you trained up when you were younger and they were younger and they're not on the trodden path today, I'm sorry to say that you have some responsibility in that. If you have kids and they're still on the trodden path, then praise the Lord. But do not give up. If they're not on the trodden path today, do not give up. If they're grown and they have their own families, then your ability to reason with them is limited. But you can still make a difference by living the Christian life that you're supposed to live by example and teaching them by example. We have to take responsibility for the, the, the stewardship that God has given us with our kids. He says they're, they're a heritage of the Lord. And I believe we'll give an account for how we have done uh, that responsibility or that work that he has given us to do. I trust this morning that you will pray and seriously consider what the Bible has to say about training your, ch your children in a godly manner, in a godly way. And, and, and do not take from the Word of God the things that you like and leave the things that you don't like. Because if that's your philosophy of training your kids, then you're flawed from the get-go. You've got to stick by the whole counsel of the Word of God. And I trust that we'll do that this morning. Would you stand with me for prayer?